Hello, Tom. Hey, is that that's Bruno, right? Oh uh, yes, this is Bruno. Yeah, yeah. I am okay. I am logged into Pim's account uh, <laughs> for organizational purposes. Um, yeah, great. Glad I wasn't going crazy. <laughs> nice to nice to uh, meet you virtually. Hey, you too. Uh, we're just going to wait a few minutes for people to join and then start. Um, if that's fine with you, I assume you have yep. some slides to share. I do. Yeah, you, do you want me to test, share them now? Yeah, maybe we can test it out now um, and see how it looks. <clears throat> okay, that's perfect. Sorry, I'm just in background making sure all the YouTube and all the technology works. Usually a PIM does it, but now I'm just making, doing some double checks before we start. Um, Okay, I think we should be we should be ready to go. Um, if that's fine with you, I'm going to introduce. I'm going to start this. So, uh, hi everyone, welcome to another uh, installation of Cats for AI. Uh, today, I'm very excited. We have Tom Gebhardt, if I pronounced your last name correctly, uh, who's going to be telling us about Sheaves for AI, uh, how to do graph representation learning through Sheaf theory. Uh, so, really, uh, take it away, Tom. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Bruno. So, um, so as the title suggests, uh, I'll be talking about sheaves and in particular why you might care about uh, sheaves in an AI context. Um, and so, so basically what I'm hoping to accomplish with this talk is just to uh, get an get intuitive understanding for sheaves and then how they might be useful, um, how the kind of constraints provided by the sheaf construction might be useful um, within a graph representation learning context. Um, there we go. <clears throat> so outlining this talk, this talk is going to be at a very high level. Um, but hopefully, as I said, you'll kind of have more of an intuitive understanding of sheaves. If not, uh, you may not have a very specific definitional definitional understanding of sheaves and all of their specificities, but uh, I'm hoping you'll have kind of a high level understanding of sheaves. And we're gonna motivate this, uh, the, the use cases for sheaves uh, by looking at a couple of problems within graph representation learning, um, in particular, 
uh, node embedding, and then this like graph signal processing, uh, where you might use something like a, a graph neural network uh, to process signals valued on some graphs. Um, and then at the end, I'll come back and show how, how these kind of motivating examples might be reformulated in the sheaf theoretic lens and, and what this generalization uh, might buy you. Uh, so just do a quick background on representation learning. Um, this is like a ubiquitous concept in machine learning. It, you could probably argue that it is the primary objective of machine learning. Um, broadly speaking, you're just looking for some sort of tractable representation of your um, original data space uh, such that uh, this, this representation like preserves important structure within the data space that informs some downstream tasks. So for example, you know, preserving information about what what features of images help you classify them into categories, for example, or, or what features about nodes in a graph allow you to, to classify them into various classes. So as far as I know, there's no canonical uh, definition of representation learning, uh, but we can be a little bit more precise uh, and, and give kind of like a, a hand wavy definition that, that might at least point towards uh, some of the motivations uh, or what we might ask for a representation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we assume our, our original space where we're drawing data samples from is formed by some sort of like union of sets, um, we might define a representation as a map from, from our space into uh, another space V. Typically in machine learning, this is just a vector space uh, like Rn. And so if we have some sort of relationship between between these sets in our original space, uh, we would like our representation, uh, in our representation space, we would also like there to be you know, some obvious map, which would map us between the representations of these open sets. And so you can probably see the kind of functoriality coming in here. Um, but in practice, like these, these G maps, what we actually care about preserving in our original space are, are generally not known. Um, and even if they are known uh, in practice, it's it's very difficult to actually find these representations and these these f maps that will uh, make this diagram commute exactly. And so often, what is used instead of because we don't know the g -max maps exactly, often what is used is some sort of like inductive bias. And uh, a very intuitive inductive bias to apply would be some sort of like locality constraints where. Uh, we have this notion that if if our if these data sets are nearby in our original space, uh, we would like to represent them as similar or nearby as well in our representation space. Um, so we can look at some some actual examples of this in practice uh, with node embedding and and graph signal processing. <clears throat> so in the node embedding case, uh, a, a very popular algorithm is the is the deep walk algorithm. Uh, which seeks some representation of our vertices. I think I've overloaded this V here uh, from the last slide, but now we're taking V to be the set of vertices in some graph, V comma E, um, and we seek a representation, just a, a vector representation of each node. And we want this representation to, in some sense, preserve the underlying structure of the graph. And so deep walk, has has a re the recipe follows like this. Um, you generate some corpus, uh, we're going to call it R, of node visits by just aggregating lists of random walks that emanate from each node. And then we're going to use this R as basically a data set. Um, we're going to feed it into this shallow neural network, which is going to to learn these embeddings by a like the skip grab and negative sampling algorithm. So we're basically going to set up a learning problem where we're trying to predict uh, a node's neighborhood given its embedding. So we're going to try to predict the embedding of, yeah, so we're going to try to predict a node's neighborhood given, it, given its embeddings. And so the result of this process is that nearby nodes in G are typically assigned similar vectors in, in this representation space. And in fact, you, you, can, you can actually decompose this, uh, this deep walk algorithm further and show that the representations actually approach something like a matrix factorization. Uh, and 
it's been shown by Chu at all that you can actually write down what this matrix that's being factorized is. And I'm just showing this here to, to really emphasize the fact that uh, the representation of node U and V, for example, um, are going to be like, if you take their inner product, uh, which is going to be the U V entry in this, in this matrix M, uh, you, you get representations or you're basically assuming representations of your nodes U and V that are that are in some sense flat. You're saying if they're nearby, it should be basically the same vector. And so this is okay for many use cases of graph embedding. And, and sometimes that's actually what you want, especially if your graph is um, homophilous, like you actually have this semantic content that nearby nodes are uh, should be represented similarly. <clears throat> But if you have a graph that's typed, this this kind of breaks. Like if you're if crossing an edge doesn't mean the same thing every time you cross an edge, especially within a node's neighborhood, uh, this can this like locality assumption can can kind of break um, because now you don't want to represent two nodes that are nearby with exactly the same vector because there's some sort of like um, non-flatness in the representations which you'd like to preserve. Now on the graph signal processing side, uh, one of the more popular ways to kind of learn features and to learn, um, for example, to classify nodes of a graph given the graph and some signals, some vectors um, that define like the, you know, some, some, something about each node in the graph. Um, a, a popular way to do this is, is via graph neural networks. And so here I'm showing just a very general form of a graph neural network, which would be like the message passing formalization. Um, and really the, the thing to note here is that we're aggregating over, we're aggregating messages from nearby nodes um, over the neighborhood of V. And then we're using this aggregation to update the representations of V. Um, so again, this like locality bias is, is pretty clear to see. <clears throat> so, We'll, uh, we're gonna dig into graph convolutional neural networks a little bit further, which are a particular uh, instantiation of this message passing neural network uh, framework. And it, graph convolutional neural networks are nice, um, at least in a theoretic sense, because they have this, this nice linear algebraic structure. Uh, so this, this message passing in graph convolutional neural networks is facilitated by this, this A tilde here. And so, a tilde is both uh, does the method passing for you. So it's the, it's the normalized adjacency matrix. Uh, so it's, it's dictating or, or encoding which nodes are nearby each other, and then also performing this summation aggregation operation. Um, so note that we could rewrite graph convolutional neural networks in terms of the graph Laplacian, which is this L tilde, or the normalized graph Laplacian. Um, and so repeated application of this I minus the graph Laplacian uh, performs this type of diffusion operation of the signals on our graph. And as you iteratively apply this operation, uh, you end up minimizing something called the Dirichlet energy, uh, which is given, given at the bottom of the slide. And <clears throat> basically what, what you should notice here is that uh, for a given channel, feature channel, um, we're minimizing the difference uh, in that feature channel across neighboring nodes. And so again, this could be good if your F is highly homophilous and you want nearby representations to be uh, basically equivalent, uh, but this can, this can break. And it's also not particularly expressive um, in that you're, you're basically learning some sort of uh, constant representations uh, with respect to some local averaging of the neighborhood. And so more explicitly, if if we were not, if we were to set up a graph convolutional neural network and then just not learn the weight matrices W, uh, if you just stacked a bunch of these layers together, uh, you would end up you would end up minimizing this Dirichlet energy uh, just by default because you're you're performing this message passing operation and just smoothing over the graph given its given its topology. In other words, you'll you'll approach the kernel of the graph Laplacian. 
And so this this begs the question, like, could we derive a, a deep neural network architecture whose message passing message passing on graphs avoids this this flatness? And so these these two examples are going to be our our motivation going forward um, as we as we start to think about sheaves. So there are a number of levels at which one could present a definition of sheaves and, and cellular sheaves. Um, I've, I've ordered these levels here by the amount of category theory that might be required to understand them. Um, this is like the, the primordial ooze scale. Um, that, that phrase, I think, is in the seven sketches for compositionality book. Um, and it, it's been stuck in my head forever because category theory feels like soup sometimes. Um, you could just as easily substitute like a like a galaxy brain scale or your, your Vince McMahon scale if you're so inclined. Um, anyways, because this is the uh, category theory for AI seminar, uh, we're actually going to, to work backwards. So we're going to go from level four down to level one, um, mostly skipping over level two for the time being. And so we'll start with a very categorical definition of sheets and then move quickly to something more uh, obviously implementable. And by the time we reach level one, we'll kind of be using the same notation and language uh, that's used in some of the applications of these ideas. And so this level four categorical definition, whatever you want to call it, um, I'm mostly borrowing from Justin Curry's uh, thesis, Sheaves, Cochise, and Applications. Um, it's a really good thesis. It's, it's, it's really readable. Um, so I encourage anyone, uh, especially if you have kind of a categorical background, uh, to read this thesis and everything should, should click pretty easily. Um, Justin Curry also gave recently a talk at, I think, the Topos Institute on uh, some applied sheaf theory in the context of uh, space communication and like satellite networking in space. Um, so if you want to hear about some of these ideas uh, straight from uh, the horse's mouth, as it were, uh, you can check out that talk as well. OK. So let's start with some open cover of a set in a topological space X. We're gonna find the we're gonna define the nerve of this cover as a simplicial complex, and simplicial com you can define the nerve of a cover as a simplicial complex, uh, basically by stringing together their their intersections. So uh, so I've kind of drawn this in a cartoonish manner. In the lower left you have some some cover, and in the center you have have the nerve of this cover. And so this this cover or sorry this nerve construction. Uh, actually assembles into a category in its own right. And we're going to take this, this nerve viewed as a category and define a functor into the category of open sets over X. Um, but we're, we're going to do all of this in the opposite category. Um, so sheaves work in, in this, this opposite category, um, co-sheaves, which I'm not going to talk about in this, in this talk. Um, but as you might imagine, flip all of the arrows around. So we can define a pre-sheaf valued in data category D as a functor from the category of open sets or this opposite category into, into D with morphisms or restriction maps uh, given by uh, in this data category, we're mapping from um, the, the object F of V to F of U uh, whenever U is a subset of V. So it's called a restriction map. We're restriction, restricting down to uh, the, the subset of U within V. So this pre-sheaf definition almost gives us what we want um, from our original kind of hand wavy definition of a, of a representation. Uh, in that we're, we're taking some space and we have a functor of this space uh, into, some other, into some other category. But as we saw in some of our examples, we, we really had these like constraints that we wanted to deal with. Like we didn't want just any representation in, in D. We wanted something that was that was constrained to um, 
to, to kind of match the data in some way, to match the underlying topology of X. And so, so this is this is kind of the, the intuition for why you would, would want to move into this or why you would actually add this extra structure, which is a sheaf. And so a pre-sheaf is the sheaf on this open cover. If basically there it's a pre-sheaf is the limit of this open cover. So if you have familiarity with limits in the categorical context, uh, you're, you're, you're done. You understand what a sheaf is. For me, uh, this is a little bit too abstract of, of a definition. Um, kind of feels like it'll just blow away in the wind. So one, one might ask if, if there's like a way to view this as a computable object. A sheaf is a computable object um, from this, this pre-sheaf structure. And in fact, there is. Uh, so sheaves are, we can view sheaves as the equalizers of some diagram. And this diagram is formed by taking the product over the vertices of this open cover. So if we have this open cover, or we have this nerve, for example. We're going to take the vertices of the nerve to find the product. And then we're going to map from this product down to the, the intersection, the pairwise intersection of open sets. And so sheaf is the, is the equalizer of this diagram. Um, to get a little bit, like for me, it, it helps to uh, just throw away this product structure for the time being and focus on just the definition of an equal, equalizer, which helps to get a little bit more intuition for what's going on here. So if we, if we set this, this product of the individual vertex elements uh, equal to some set A and their, their intersection to be some set B, then the equalizer of, <clears throat> if, of this F plus and F minus map, um, which are these positive and negatively oriented projections onto this intersection of these two. Of, of the sets of the products. Um, anyways, the equalizer is, this is just a set theoretic function equalizer. Uh, if by contrast, uh, F plus sends everything to B, so it's constant at B, then this equalizer is 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 the fiber of, of B within A. And most importantly for our use cases, if we, instead of taking A and B to be sets, we take, uh, these, these products be V and W, two vector spaces. Uh, then this equalizer we can actually compute as the kernel of the difference between these two maps. So we're basically setting uh, F plus minus, or F, we want to map through this E, uh, E to F plus equals E composed with F plus equals E composed with F minus. And so if you, just rearrange this. We're actually looking for the, the kernel of the difference between these two maps. Uh, and so this is known as the difference between these no, two maps is known as the co-boundary. And um, so for the rest of this talk, we'll, this co-boundary will show up everywhere. And this is going to be how we're going to actually compute a sheaf per se. All right, so to, so to recap, a pre-sheaf is simply a functor which maps us from our original topological space into our data category. We can compute sheaves as equalizers with values on open sets coming from uh, some restriction of their product structure. When our data category is uh, the category of vector spaces uh, with linear maps as morphisms, uh, these sheaves, can, we can kind of compute what this sheaf space is in the linear algebraic sense uh, as the kernel of some math. So we had this, we have this uh, open set, this open cover construction. Uh, but a lot of times when we're given data, it's not quite clear what these open sets should be. Uh, you, you might have to think quite a bit about what, how you define this open cover. Um, <clears throat> but if we're given graphs, some sort of cellular structure, this open set structure, there's actually a natural open set structure, which you can, which you can define on the graph, which allows you to immediately start, excuse me, immediately uh, move to using this, this uh, sheaf theoretic 
uh, structure. So <clears throat> typically when you encode a graph as a cell complex or simplicial complex, uh, the vertices form the zero cells and the edges form the one cells. And so these organize into, into this like PASA diagram, this kind of post set here, uh, where you have zero cells mapping into, into one cells, which are the edges. Um, <clears throat> so this in, in the open set space, so remember we, we need this like inclusion functor into the category of open sets. Um, a topologist might be a little bit uncomfortable by this because our maps are in some sense reversed. Um, but there's another way to view this open set structure as just the Alexandrov topology formed by the taking the stars of these of these cells. So taking the star, this blue um, open set of this vertex uh, is kind of this open set which crosses the edge. And then their intersection, or the, the star of the, the edge is, is just the edge. And so the, you kind of reverse reverse the inclusion structure when you're using the Alexandrov topology. All of this is to say, um, you if you would like, you can kind of ignore the uh, the required open set topology on the graph uh, when you're working with sheaves on graphs or cellular sheaves, um, and instead just work with this this cellular complex uh, where you're moving from low cells, your restriction maps are taking you to uh, the dimension above. So we're going to be working over kind of this diagram. So this product space, um, this product space, which is like our, our collection of representations formed by the pre-sheaf, uh, is going to be over the, the vertices in our cell complex. And then we're going to restrict to the product space over edges. All right, so, so let's continue kind of moving towards applying this out in the real world. Um, so there are a number of things that we require in order to even define a sheaf, and that's some space X, which usually that's given. So we're, we're, we're going to check that off as being, being given. Uh, we require some open set, which also is given, but then some open cover on U, which in machine learning, that's often ignored. And on the previous slide, I kind of explained how you might also be able to ignore this and just treat uh, your graph or given data as some sort of, um, has some sort of default topology applied to it. You're also, we also require a data category D. And so in the machine learning field, this is almost always, uh, uh, you're almost always working with vector representations. Um, it's, it's important to note that you, we have this ability to choose with what our representation space is excuse me, through this sheaf theoretic framework. And then we also need these restriction maps, which, which map us between um, uh, basically the, 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 our vertices and their intersections. And this is mostly ignored or taken to be trivial, like the identity um, in, in the machine learning context. And so the main point I'm trying to, to get across here is that if we treat graphs is cell complexes. Um, we, can, we can use the theory of cellular sheaves to provide kind of a model for representation learning on graphs, which is uh, both like a formal model, like we have all of this uh, categorical machinery working behind the scenes. And then also it, it, it allows us to kind of uh, increase the expressiveness of these um, kind of locality diffusion uh, representation operations, which we're working with in practice. <clears throat> so we can go all the way down to, to level one and start talking about sheaves on graphs, given all of our previous um, understanding of what, what, what actually is a sheaf or a cellular sheaf. So sheaf on a graph, uh, you can view it as just maybe like a, like a, some sort of data structure, for example. Um, so it consists of a vector space, over each vertex, a vector space over each edge. So these spaces are called the stocks, the sheaf. And then linear maps, which take us from the vector space of the vertices to the vector space of edges for each incident vertex edge pair. And 
you'll recall we had these product space, product over the vertices. Uh, we're going to define the same thing for uh, sheaves on graphs, where now the space, what we're calling the space of zero code chains, is exactly this product operation. And similarly, we're going to define this, the space of one code chains uh, as the product of these, these uh, cover intersections in our previous language. And so if everything is vector valued, <clears throat> then uh, we can kind of view the space of zero code chains as just like this concatenated, <clears throat> excuse me, concatenated vector of, of code chains, uh, which break down over, over the nodes of V in a particular way. So we're viewing it as a vector in that we would like to apply some sort of co-boundary map to it. And so this is this F plus minus F minus map that we had uh, seen earlier in our discussion of sheaves as equalizers. And so the co-boundary map takes us from the space of um, zero cochains to one cochains across an edge, uh, taking the difference of a positively oriented um, map onto edge E from node V minus uh, a negatively oriented map onto edge E from uh, vertex U. And so what, what, is, what does this co-boundary operator give us? Well, as we saw previously, we can actually compute the space. We can compute what the sheaf structure is uh, by looking at the kernel of this co-boundary operator. And so this kernel is a subspace of the our, uh, space of zero co-chains. <clears throat> and uh, it, it represents, so elements from from uh, this kernel are the this the subspace is denoted H zero, and uh, elements from this kernel are those choices of of cochains. So, for example, choices of vectors over each node, uh, which are which are globally consistent, given our assignment of restriction maps onto onto each edge of the graph, and so. If we note that the co-boundary map takes us from space of zero cochains to one cochains, so it maps us from vertices onto edges and takes some like difference on edges, basically. <clears throat> this, if if we recall our definition of the graph Laplacian, this this kind of looks similar to the graph Laplacian in some sense, um, and we were using the graph Laplacian pr previously as you know, this uh, this diffusion operator that takes us. You know, on these simple, uh, in, in this case, the cochains are one dimensional, um, uh, simple, simple diffusion process on, on the graph. So one might ask whether we can, we can define some sort of uh, similar operator, which, which we can use to perform message passing on the sheaf. And in fact, this, this exists, this is the sheaf Laplacian, which, uh, I think was was mostly figured out and and um, by by Jacob Hansen in his thesis and in this uh, summary paper toward a spectral theory of cellular sheaves. Um, so the construction of the sheaf Laplacian is exactly the same as with the graph graph Laplacian. So you take this product of the co-boundary operator, and there are, again a number of different kind of equivalent views of the sheaf Laplacian. Um, in particular, this what we might call sheaf Dirichlet energy uh, in the in the last row, which is the quadratic form of a cochain with with the, the sheaf Laplacian. Um, we're we're going to study this in a little bit more detail, or we want to keep this in mind in our application section, because uh, any cochain, any choice of of vectors over our nodes, any representation, if you will. Uh, which is equal to zero, has the sheaf Dirichlet energy equal to zero, implies that this cochain uh, comes from the space of globally consistent sections. And <clears throat> of course, we can we can actually recover the graph Laplacian in this sheaf theoretic language. Um, so as I was saying earlier, the graph Laplacian is actually almost like a degenerate case of the sheaf Laplacian, where <clears throat> the 
your stocks over each vertex are simply R, just a one-dimensional vector or one-dimensional real value. Um, and same thing over the edges. So your stock spaces are one-dimensional. And then uh, your restriction maps are chosen such that they are equal to the weight um, given by the adjacency matrix of the graph. So under this scenario, the sheaf Laplacian is equivalent to the graph Laplacian. Okay, so we've we've gone all the way from kind of category theoretic introduction to sheaves, uh, hopefully somewhat consistently in terminology uh, down to sheaves on graphs and even the graph Laplacian. So how can we use this like full spectrum in applications? So if you recall from the, get, the beginning, we had this node embedding problem, um, which we're using deep walk to solve. Uh, we aggregated a bunch of random walks in the graph and then learned some embedding of these random walks, which turned out to be uh, simply like matrix factorization of, of and, and the representations were implicitly like homophilous and nearby nodes along random walks were sent to nearby uh, vectors in our, in our uh, representation space. And we noted that this, this would probably break down if we had some sort of typing structure on the graph uh, where two things being connected doesn't mean that they should be represented equally. And so knowledge graphs are exactly such, such a graph with this typing structure. Um, and the, the task of knowledge graph embedding seeks to embed one of these one of these heterogeneous uh, knowledge graph into some vector space such that you could use the embeddings to, um, for example, in, infer new information about uh, the outside world. So if your knowledge graph is encoding facts about the world, like um, what are the favorite films of your friends, uh, you could use uh, your knowledge graph embedding to, for example, infer uh, the favorite film of, of a new friend if you don't know what their favorite film is, but you know who they're friends with. So if we take a set S of entity types and R, that R of relations, we can bundle them into this tuple, which we're calling the knowledge schema Q. Um, and we're also, we have this like kind of typing structure, which tells us what the head type of the relation is and what the, excuse me, tail type of the relation is. So we have this person type and we have a uh, head type of favorite, that, oh, sorry, Person type, film type, we have this favorite film relation. And the head type of the favorite film is person, tail type is of type film. And so knowledge graphs, we're, we're going to define a knowledge graph as a, as a graph morphism, which instantiates, instantiates some uh, knowledge about the world under this typing structure. So for example, we survey a bunch of our friends and uh, we ask what their favorite movies are, and we create this, this instantiate, instantiation, I'm not sure why that's so hard, um, of this schema, which is our knowledge graph. So given this instantiation, we can learn a knowledge sheaf embedding of this graph G um, as a sheaf on this knowledge schema, together with the, with the zero co-chain, which, which we're viewing as coming from like the pullback sheaf um, across this graph morphism. And <clears throat> so basically what we're, what we're doing is we're assigning some, some representations to our, to our schema. So we're saying this person type is going to be represented by some, for example, three-dimensional vector space, uh, favorite film, uh, we're we're going to have morphisms of this favorite film with uh, some restriction maps, which are going to take us onto uh, onto this into this two dimensional space, and then also we're um, having a we're defining some sort of or choosing some sort of uh, representation space for for films, and then we're going to learn a zero cochain and restriction maps for this uh, for this sheaf, uh, kind of simultaneously from from the data. And so typically this data 
uh, I can go back here. Typically, this data comes from some sort of um, similar to skip grammar and negative sampling. You're using some like contrastive uh, training approach where you're <clears throat> trying to uh, basically predict uh, things that actually are connected in the into the in the knowledge graph and uh, be basically have uh, um, be lacking consistency if you if you were to take facts which don't exist in the knowledge graph or which are false. So it turns out, and and we showed this in a recent paper that um, a lot of the most popular knowledge graph embedding methods um, are implicitly learning such sheaf representations. Like they're do they're they're performing this sheaf learning problem, um, albeit w w without this sheaf theoretic background or or framework. And so what we did was was basically show that this is the case. Like these two ideas are are formally related. Um, which is kind of interesting that that we're the the best way to or the the most popular way to embed a, a knowledge graph uh, implicitly uses this chief theoretic framework. Um, and so we're we're learning these relation representations and uh, these entity representations that are kind of smooth or consistent with respect to this typing schema, which is posed by our our typing structure and the restriction maps which we've chosen, or the space of restriction maps, which we've or sorry, the yeah, you given me. <clears throat> so once you've made this connection between um, cellular sheaves and knowledge graph embedding, the the upside is that you can now bring in all of this uh, this spectral theory of cellular sheaves um, to, for example, solve boundary value problems on the knowledge graph. And you can do this with um, harmonic extension over the the sheaf Laplacian. So harmonic extension, which is typically which has a uh, graph theoretic definition, um, also applies to sheaves. And one way you might use this kind of harmonic extension um, boundary value problem um, with a knowledge graph embedding is if you want to infer some uh, more complex uh, queries with, of the form that I've that I've shown at the bottom of the slide, where you have some sort of unknown intermediate nodes, which you're trying to basically kind of, uh, kind of quotient over. Um, so like, what is Julia's friend's friend's favorite movie? We don't know who these friends are. So we want to basically create this sub-representation uh, which would allow us to answer this question. And we can do this via harmonic extension. So another way you might use these, uh, this kind of sheaf theoretic framework in practice uh, is as a generalization of graph neural networks. And so earlier we saw that graph neural networks work by <clears throat> mostly by diffusing over uh, each channel of the node features independently. And so let's assume we're given some sort of sheaf structure. Uh, so we're given restriction maps. So we're given a sheaf on a graph, if you will. Um, and we want to learn, and, and we're also given signals that we can view as co-chains on the graph. And so, so now we want to learn some map, uh, which will learn features, so learn new representations of these co-chains, which are suitable for solving some downstream tasks like classifying the vertices. Uh, so in other words, this we're going to define a sheaf neural network layer as mapping us from space of zero co-chains to the space of zero co-chains. And so you can define a sheaf neural network, a sheaf convolutional neural network layer, um, basically in the same form as the graph convolutional neural network layer, but Instead of the graph Laplacian, we're using the sheaf Laplacian. And then because we're working both with um, this kind of channel wise feature representation that's popular in the graph convolutional or graph neural network literature, and we're, we're assuming to have these co chains, you, you need some way to go from your, your parameterized W map uh, taking kind of. Um, which is which is augmenting your your channels, 
and mapping it, it mapping this representation into code chains, which is this kind of I times B um, or I product with B. Uh, it's, it's basically just a, a restructuring of X into some code chain structure. And so again, repeated application of um, I minus the sheeple plotion, it's gonna smooth each code chain, but this time with respect to the sheep structure. So we're no longer limited to just learning uh, these flat representations or, or biasing towards these flat representations. <clears throat> so just as a, a quick comparison between the two, we have graph convolutional neural networks on the right, sheaf convolutional neural network, sorry, graph convolutional neural networks on the left and sheaves on the right. Um, in particular, the, the, the final row is what we're really focusing on here, which is, uh, it, it really exemplifies that we're, that we're working, when we're working with sheaf convolutional neural networks, we have this kind of these restriction maps, which are giving us these, uh, allowing us to have these, these non-flat representations between adjacent nodes. And so it turns out that this generalization to sheaf neural networks is actually useful in practice. Um, in our original paper, which introduced sheaf neural networks, uh, we we uh, came up with this synthetic node classification experiment over sine graphs uh, to emphasize the fact that graph convolutional neural networks, due to this requirement that the representations are flat, uh, can't really learn to solve a task uh, that involves this type of sign graph where, for example, the, the classes of nodes are connected, or nodes of two, two different classes are connected, uh, but they're, they're maybe flipped by a sign. However, sheaf neural networks can, can handle this just fine. Uh, more recently, uh, Bodnar et al. extended this, this empirical evidence. Um, so in the, in the table in the lower right-hand side, the data sets which they're performing uh, node classification on uh, are ordered from least homophilus to most homophilus. And as you can, as it might be expected by all of the, the previous theory, um, the sheaf convolutional neural networks tend to outperform in this heterogeneous setting. Um, and their paper also includes some, uh, some nice theoretical work about what kinds of classification problems um, might be solved by just purely doing sheaf diffusion. Uh, so basically, what what sort of like linear separability can you get by choosing restriction maps in in a proper way? Uh, I guess one caveat to to the sheaf neural network stuff is um, generally you're not given restriction maps. Um, a lot of graph representation or graph learning data sets do not come with a um, a natural sheaf structure, and often it's not even clear how one would impart a natural sheaf structure. And so you can you can of course learn these sheaf or learn these restriction maps while you're trying to solve this classification problem, um, but you need to make sure you're not kind of overparameterizing because you're if you're allowing your restriction maps to be uh, to be kind of full rank uh, or basically if you have a d by d restriction map for each head and tail or for each side of an edge uh, for every edge in your graph, that's a lot of parameters. Uh, so often you'll, you'll need to choose or learn restriction maps that are uh, constrained to exist within some subspace. All right, so that's all I have to talk about. Um, I'm happy to take some questions and here are some references in case anyone wants some more information. Thank you so much, Tom. This was this was very very interesting. Um, if you're in the audience on YouTube or on Zoom, feel free to ask your questions uh, in the chat or raise your hand, and I can uh, I can direct them to Tom. Um, while we wait for questions, maybe maybe I have a just a short question of my own. I am. Uh, I'm doing a lot of category theory and, and deep learning, but not specifically sheaves. So I'm still quite, I would say, new to understanding the intuition. 
I, I think your talk made a lot of progress in like making some things click. Um, but is my intuition correct that if I have a functor out of a category um, and it maps objects to some sort of representations, if I think of these objects as sort of being, as you said, covers, right? It might be the case that a cover contains some other objects and I want the action on the whole thing to be coherent with sort of the, the actual individual things, right? Which is, if I understood correctly, the, the limit isomorphism. Yeah. Yeah, so so basically the 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 sheaf ax axioms kind of constrain what this functor can be, and, and so we're going into this with some sort of uh, predisposition that uh, this this cover is actually is is useful. It is encoding something about the underlying topological space, and we want our resulting representations to also respect that. That's this kind of the the crux of the, the sheaf axioms. Right, right. And I like so, yeah, they're, they're, they're this limit, limit object. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked how, I liked the distinction when you said of what things are usually acknowledged in machine learning papers. And it was interesting to see, right, these are these things are implicit and often we don't really explicitly tag, you know, we have these open covers. What do we how do we want them to be preserved? Um uh, so, so there was one more question for me. You mentioned at some point uh, knowledge graphs, and I, and I don't know whether you're familiar, but this reminded me of sort of the way you used them and the way you talked about them remind reminded me of of schemas from database theory that David Spivak used quite a lot. So I, I don't know mm -hmm. whether you know about this connection. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's um, the connection is almost. I guess the, the the connection, like the the knowledge schema that we've defined, is maybe more simplistic than what is set up in like the the, the database schema uh, stuff that, that David um, and Brendan Fong have in their like Seven Sketches book. Um, I haven't actually worked through exactly how how they're different, um, but the the general motivation is the same. You have some sort of typing. That you need to preserve as you move across, um, as for example, as you like, as a functor transfer information between two, between two databases, between two schema. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'll be honest. On my end, I sort of towards the end, given that my sheaf knowledge isn't the best, I I didn't quite get sort of. The whole application starts towards the end. So unless unless somebody asks another question, maybe I'll just pose one more, uh, and then then we can call it a day. Which was so. Did this sheaf condition sort of give you like a, a loss function constraint in some form, or 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 did I misunderstand the way you used it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, that that's kind of the the nice thing about uh, cellular sheaf this or the sheaf theoretic framework in that. Um, like for example, in the in the knowledge graph embedding case, it's it's kind of a, a semi-supervised learning setup where um, you're given some let's call it true knowledge graph, uh, which encodes some information about the world, and you want to um, find an embedding of this true knowledge graph. Uh, so what you can do is uh, basically set up like a a learning problem where you're, you're given a bunch of like uh, nodes and edges, but without the without the other incident node. And you're going to your learning problem is basically going to rank all of the other uh, entities that could answer the question. Um, so I can actually go back here to make this a little bit more explicit. <clears throat> so so the the problem might be like. In, in my training set, I have Julia and friends with, and then I'm I'm kind of masking out uh, the the tail of of this of this query of this triplet, and then my learning task is going to be to find embeddings that uh, basically when I when I plug in the embedding for Sachin, I will minimize the the co boundary across this edge, and so I mentioned you you. 
typically how this is done is in some kind of contrastive approach where you both take positive examples. So Julia, friends, and fashion, but then you also take negative examples like Julia, friends, Anya. This is this is not true within this knowledge graph that we've currently uh, denoted here. And then so you would want your Julia, friends with Anya to be to be more negative, or you you would want your consistency to be to be worse. And so this sets up kind of a a learning problem. But in general, like this chief, like searching for these these kernel spaces is kind of a natural, um, unsupervised uh, objective in some sense. Uh, so, so that that's another reason why this kind of chief theoretic framework is is nice in that we have this uh, this natural objective which comes from searching for this limit object. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So do I quite understand that you're saying that this is something that, right, this is an objective uh, sort of, of a loss function that I could use in a, right, mm -hmm. right. Um, so we have a question from Adel. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it out nonetheless. Uh, on the application level, what is the relationship between the shift diffusion operator and the geometry of the underlying vector space. In particular, is there a natural way to account for non-Euclidean geometries into the con construction of shift uh, convolutional networks? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. Um, so I think in in the way that I've introduced uh, this problem, or in, in the way I've introduced maybe like shift learning or uh, or uh, shift convolutional neural networks. It's not clear to me that if you're just using uh, the category of vector spaces, the kind of unconstrained category of vector spaces, that you would be able to, uh, if you know your representation should be in some sort of different space that's not Euclidean, um, it's, it's not clear that you would be able to get that uh, just from choosing restriction maps uh, properly. Uh, but as I was saying earlier, um, the, the nice thing about this chief theoretic framework is that you, you're free to choose your category D. Um, and so if you have some, uh, if you can, can, can construct your category D in such a way where you're, uh, you know that your representations are of the form, uh, which, which you'd want some sort of maybe like hyperbolic representation or something. I'm not sure what that category looks like. Not really a category theorist in general. But um, th this might be kind of the inroad to thinking about, okay, if I want some sort of non-Euclidean structure, uh, th that that's how you would go about doing it. And then your restriction maps would fall out of that choice of D. Um, you would need to be able to map between different objects within that category. And that's how you would uh, parameterize the space of restriction maps. Um, right, uh, since there seem, seem to be no more questions, uh, I'm going to thank you again for taking the time uh, to share this stuff. There, it, it's really fascinating and uh, uh, something I'm hoping to get more, more into uh, as time goes on. Uh, so thank you again. And, uh, and yeah, uh, this was great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And Oh, I think we have a follow-up question. You can answer it real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I see it. Yeah, I just showed up. Uh, so following up on the previous question, it's usually easy to capture only topological qualities and no geometrical ones. Question mark. Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by topological and geometrical qualities. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure what is meant there, but um, yeah, like if you if you're trying to encode something about the the geometry of your underlying space, like your your something about the actual geometry of the actual graph itself, uh, that would be hard because again, we're just working with this open set structure, so we're looking at intersections, like overlaps of pieces of this this underlying space. Um, so I don't I don't know if that helps at all. Anyways, I will I will continue saying uh, thank you so much for having me, and uh, this is a lot of fun. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye.